Hi everybody, welcome to week three uh, of our 12-week course. We are moving right along and this week we're going to be talking about models of federalism and this this builds on what we were talking about last week and I think this foundational knowledge is really important as we move into more specific subject matter area in the rest of the course. So let me move into what I want to talk about this week and, and describe some highlights from the reading. So, you know, before I do that, let's let me talk a little bit about my observations from the discussion last week where in particular we talked about the Federalist Papers and we talked about three in, uh, in greater detail, Federalist number 10 and then number 45 and number 46. There's obviously a lot more Federalist papers or essays than that. Um, and we talked about those just because number 10 is probably the most widely read of all the Federalist papers, the one by Madison where he talks about faction. And then 45 and 46 are very important talking about the relationship between the states and the national level government and that's why I, I selected those. But certainly there are others, and I think in the discussion, some of you referred to other Federalist essays, and I referred to other ones themselves. So, but let's talk about some of the things that came up in the discussion. First of all, on, on Federalist number 10, you know, what did Madison mean by this idea of faction? And, and we, a lot of us kind of questioned each other on this. Did he mean political parties? as they were understood then. I mean, there were political parties in England, you know, in the mother country, so to speak, um, to some extent. Um, there weren't political parties in the new country in the United States. And so the question has always been, you know, is, was that a blind spot that Madison and the other founders, did they not understand that there could be the rise of political parties because in fact political parties really rose right away the federalists as they were called were the were more or less the hamiltonians who believed in a stronger central government and what were known initially as the republicans were really the genesis of the democratic party and that included famously people like jefferson um, the Federalist really only held the office of president through Adams. And after that, you know, the Federalist Party itself only lasted maybe another 15 or 20 years, but never held the office of president again. Um, so did he mean that? Uh, was he referring to regional differences? For example, North uh, and versus South? Um, you know, the North was was very much into um, commercialism and um, financial, the financial sector as well as manufacturing. The South, of course, was more agricultural. Uh, was he referring to pro-slavery versus abolitionism? You know, uh, pro-slavery parties were particularly found in the South, so it was a regional issue, but there were pro-slavery factions in the North. Abolitionists uh, were a smaller faction, but they were certainly strong. Um, so was he referring to that? Was he talking about manufacturing versus agriculture? What was he really referring to? Was he referring to sectional differences and cabals of states? Uh, was he referring to large states versus small states? So it's really kind of unclear what he, what he was talking about. Um, and then the second thing that came up in our discussion or, or uh, another thing that came up in the discussion was this issue of how officials of the national government by the Constitution and then expanded upon in in the Federalist Papers how were they elected or accurately selected because you know if we read the Constitution and if then we read the explanation of the Constitution in the Federalist Papers what we learn is that really the people and and the that group the people was very narrowly defined then it was typically um, free white men and in some states 
they actually had to be property owners. Um, so the people, that narrow group n group of voters, were were only voting for members of the House of Representatives. The Senate was indirectly elected by state legislatures. The president was even more indirectly elected by this animal we know as the Electoral College, which, which wasn't just this formality that it, it resembles now. It was actually a group of people who were sent to elect the president, and they were selected by state legislatures also. Um, so, and then of course we have the judiciary, which we really didn't even talk about that much in the discussion, but the judiciary judges were appointed basically by the president with the consent of the Senate. So they served for life. So they were even more selectively elected, if you will, into their office. So what does that structure say about the view of the founders towards this group called the people? Um, we tend to forget that uh, when we, you know, sometimes refer to the Constitution, we tend to forget that most of us really wouldn't be voting for m members of the House of Representatives or certainly not members of the Senate or the President. So that's just a question. What does the structure say about how the founders felt about the people? And then when we got into uh, Federalist 45 and 46, we had a lot of questions there. You know, do citizens actually feel more affinity to the state than to their nation? Um, and in fact, uh, the Tar reading um, and the Krislov readings are kind of asked that question. But, you know, Madison said that. He said, you know, naturally citizens feel more affinity towards their state. Well, perhaps they did, um, but perhaps they didn't. Perhaps he was just saying that as, a, as an advocacy statement um, for to more or less appease the anti-federalists. Um, and then what about this issue of, of the militia versus the national army? Um, what, you know, what did the states actually control in the militia? What was the role of the militia? Um, there's a lot of debate on that. The, in the Constitution, the Congress actually has the power to set the rules for the, the state militia. So they really aren't these independent state-owned uh, private militaries. They have to abide by rules set out by the national government. And that, of course, has changed over time, that relationship, as I pointed out in my lecture last week. And then, so finally we talked about the purposes of the Federalist Papers themselves. And we shouldn't forget, the Federalist Papers really had had several purposes. The main purpose was advocacy. They were a series of essays published in newspapers in New York and Virginia, but primarily to sway those constitutional conventions to ratify the Constitution. So they were advocacy pieces. They also are commentaries on convention thought. What were those 40 plus people who were in the Constitutional Convention, what were they thinking when they put in the Constitution the words they did? For example, I, I think I responded to um, someone when uh, th th this issue of judicial review came up. You know, th the concept of judicial review is nowhere in the Constitution. You won't find it in in Article 3 of the Constitution. But you will find it in Federalist Number 78. So from that it, it kind of becomes clear what the founders were thinking about the role of the Supreme Court, for example, or the courts in general. That they did have this role to declare statutes unconstitutional or in not keeping with the spirit of the Constitution. So it's not enough necessarily just to read the document itself, just to read the Constitution. And finally, and this question came up somewhat, but what is our, our political identity and what is our relationship with federalism? What does it mean to us? And so this week, um, these readings by Tarr 
and the optional one by Chris Loff kind of go into that in some detail. But so for the rest of this lecture, I want to talk about um, models of federalism. And I am not going to cover every single model of federalism that's in the reading. I just want to stress that point. There's, there's more models of federalism and, and more discussion of um, different kinds of ideas about federalism in the reading. So keep that in mind. This lecture is not the whole subject matter. Um, and I guess I'm sorry here I popped up I put this slide in and I just want to talk about this for a second before I get to models of federalism. Um, I mentioned um, John Rohr the scholar from Virginia Tech who passed away recently in I think 2011 or 2012 um, and John Rohr spent a great deal of his career, most of his career really, writing about the Constitution and its meaning for public administrators. Um, and I included a paper that I had written a couple years back talking about John Rohr and his writings. And I, um, the thing I like about Rohr is that um, what he really does is he tells public administrators why the Constitution applies to them. Um, you're all MPA students. You, you all read Woodrow Wilson, um, and Rohr really took issue with Wilson because Wilson was very un, unenthusiastic about the separation of powers. In, a, in an essay he wrote a couple of years prior to his famous essay um, that we all read on administration, he actually recommended that the Constitution be amended to um, make, make the government more of a unitary British-style government wherein um, the cabinet members would be members of this, the Senate or the House as well. Um, but as opposed to Wilson, Rohr actually says that the Constitution has a lot to say about administration, even though Wilson said really the Constitution has nothing to say about administration. And that's because Rohr takes a slightly different event of, or a slightly different view of the Constitution. He says the Constitution was this founding event. And so it's important to understand not just the document itself, but the deliberation and the context of this founding. Um, he believes that a thorough understanding of the Constitution includes an understanding of the document, of the Federalist Papers, of the Anti-Federalist writings, and of this whole history of Supreme Court decisions that we've had for 230 years, um, not just the decisions themselves, who won and who lost, but the deliberation that went that took place. So he very much sees the Constitution as the document, but also as the deliberation that has gone into telling us what the document means. Um, another thing Rohr does for us, really, as public administrators is that he clarifies this idea of, um, you know, how how are officers in the federal government uh, selected? Um, you know, it's very popular for some people, particularly politicians, to often talk about unelected judges making decisions or unelected bureaucrats. Well, they're unelected because that's the design. You know, the Constitution says that that the members of the court, at least the federal court, are not elected. Now, in some states, judges are elected, and in some states, they're appointed by the governor and the legislature, kind of mirroring the, the federal constitution. But just because a federal official is not elected doesn't mean that they're unconstitutional. You know, bureaucrats and military officers are unelected because that's the constitutional design. Um, so, what Rohr's point is, is don't let somebody tell you <laughs> that what you do is, is not in keeping with the Constitution just because you weren't elected by the people. Because there are many ways that people are legally and constitutionally appointed to their offices. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you because I really think Rohr has a lot to say about how we should feel about the Constitution and the legitimacy um, of public administrators. In the constitutional scheme of things, and I I encourage you to um, 
look at some of his books if you're more interested in that. So now, <laughs> let me get into some of these models of uh, federalism. So this is from the Wright 2008 reading. Um, and here Wright shares, has these three models of intergovernmental relations. He has this coordinate uh, relationship, the overlapping relationship, and the inclusive relationship. So let's talk about those just a little bit. Um, and they're all really framed in terms of these circles. So first of all, on the far left, you saw this coordinate relationship where, where you had actually two sets of circles, right? You had the state and local circle with the local circle being uh, subservient to the state circle. And then separately, you had the national circle. So this is really, um, the coordinate authority model is really dual federalism. So what that's really saying is that um, uh, dual federalism was this model where the state has some constitutional authorities and the national government has constitutional authorities. But within the state, uh, the local governments really are at, uh, they are creatures of the state. And all this comes from this thing called Dillon's Rule. Uh, Dillon was a judge in Iowa who, who first uh, propagated this rule in the 1800s, basically saying that localities within the state have no authority except that which the state gives them. Uh, so, for example, this is played out all over the United States. You know, typically in a state, uh, if, a, if a city wants to, for example, have an income tax, they have to have the specific permission of the state to do that. Or the state has to have a law that says a locality can, for example, add a quarter of a percent or a half a percent or a percent to the existing state income tax. But localities operate at the will of the legislature. But the state itself has, has delegated powers from the Constitution that the federal government should not impinge on. Likewise, the national government has specific, specified powers that the states can impinge on. And so that's dual federalism or the coordinate authority model. So over on the other side, we saw those three concentric circles, and this is the overlapping independent model. This model implies that there is a hierarchy, that the national government is supreme to state governments. And so it's a zero sum game. When the national government wants more authority over some issues, that necessarily means that the state or the locality is losing authority. And then of course, the local governments are subservient to the state governments as in the previous model. But this model very much tells us or informs us that, um, that federalism is a hierarchical relationship. The, right in the middle, we had, you saw these three interlocking circles. And so what this model is telling us is that authority and responsibility are overlapping in this scheme. That, that substantial areas of government operations include all three levels. And that there are areas of autonomy for each branch, for each level of government, but those are relatively small. And so power is shared and responsibility is shared. And that influence available to any one jurisdiction is limited. So this means that typically these units of government or these levels of government end up bargaining with each other over who has authority over certain things. And so actually some laws have played out this way. There has been an ongoing uh, debate and bargain over Medicaid, for example, for the past 50 years. And that continues today because the Affordable Care Act touched Medicaid. And as we know, um, some states have balked at that. Some states have expanded Medicaid and some states haven't. So that continues to go on where we have these this overlapping authority over various programs. And so federalism itself is seen in this model anyway, as, as an overlapping uh, 
authority exercise. Now, this chart here, this is an expansion of a chart that appears in the Conlin um, reading. And he just kind of threw the chart in there, a, a collapsed version of this chart. But this chart actually comes from another book by um, Wright um, from 1982, where he was, and he has a whole chapter on this, which I didn't make you read, but he's really talking about these models of federalism as being um, this evolutionary thing. So he talks about the first model of federalism really involved conflict. So you see in that first line it says conflict and way over on the right it says 19th century to the 1930s. Well this was the era of dual federalism but it was also an era of antagonistic relations between the states and the national government. So this is at the point of time where we get this idea that federalism could be modeled as this layer cake. So we have three layers and the layers touch each other, but they don't overlap with each other. Um, compare that to the next phase where we have this idea of this, what's called this marble cake federalism, where uh, we have cooperative federalism where various programs can't be executed by just one level of government. They're shared and so we have this mix where sometimes it's hard to understand um, who's doing what to whom um, and which level of government is actually executing a program. And so I gave you this Grodzen writing from 1960. Um, it's kind of quaint in a way, actually, the example he gives. It's it's kind of fun to read. Um, he talks about this person called the county sanitarium and what this person does. And he uses that example to demonstrate what he calls marble cake federalism. But, we, but Wright points out in this book that federalism has gone through various evolutions as, we, as we've gone forward in time. And what this evolution is marked by is increasing expertise in the, the, the programs that are being delivered by all governments. Increasing expertise is required for the programs that are being delivered by all governments. So when uh, in the era of dual federalism, we're really talking about general purpose governments, both the national government and state governments, general purpose governments who didn't deliver real complicated programs. But as time went on, programs became more um, complicated, calling for more expertise. And so we get to finally about four, four or five down, we get to this era of what's called competitive federalism. Um, where there's disagreement and tension between the levels of government and where there's a lot of expertise required to actually carry out these programs because they consist of a lot of, of grants from the federal government. And so it consists of grant writing, a lot of revenue sharing, um, and a lot of sp specific understanding required to actually make the programs work. And so um, we, talk about this model of federalism called this picket fence federalism. So let me look, let me talk about a couple of these just for a second. So here you've heard of these, um, you know, these early cake models. So um, Grodzen in uh, 1960 talked about this in, the, in that writing. He talked about this idea of layer cake federalism. So that's really dual federalism in the 1800s. Um, you know, the federal government had a role, state governments had a role, municipal governments had a role. But, you know, that actually, even in that time period, wasn't necessarily purely the truth because there were programs that were executed at, at all levels of government. Um, and so this was just the conceptual model. But he says, no, you know, it's, it's this marble cake federalism where it's a pragmatic approach of mixing authority and responsibility and where one <clears throat> bureaucrat, for example, might actually be working 
for all three levels of government at once. And you can read that in his writing. And so then there's this idea of competitive federalism. Um, and so this is the famous picket fence model of federalism. And you can see on each of those slats on the picket fence refers to a different kind of area, education, welfare, highways, urban renewal. So what, what is this model purporting to be talking about? You see that the, the supports are the national, the state, and the local governments. Those are the horizontal supports of these vertical slats, which are the programs. Well, what this is really implying is that programs tend to get stovepiped and expertise becomes stovepiped. So for example, highways. You know, there are federal highway experts who work at the federal government in the Department of Transportation and elsewhere. There are also highway experts at each state level government. And there are highway and road experts at, at local governments. And so what happens is there are really two, two chains of command, if you will. There are the governments, the elected governments and the appointed officials, but there are also this community of experts who correspond with each other. And so what this, this model is purporting to, to tell us is that authority for programs actually flows in two directions, through the governments themselves and through this community of experts who actually are the people who are in the process of spending the appropriated dollars, entering into the contracts to make things happen, and talking to each other. And so we see really a two-way tension in this model. The tension between governments themselves, levels of government, the tension between um, experts. And so even within a level of government, you may have tension between the highway experts and the governor or the legislature. And you may see more cooperation among the experts than you do among levels of government. So that's what this picket fence model is purporting to tell us. And then finally, in the Conlin writing in 2008, he talks about, he actually uses a model referring to geology. You know, he compares um, models of federalism to the various kinds of rocks, right? So sedimentary rocks, metamorphic and igneous. Sedimentary, he's what he's really saying is that the federalism we see currently in evidence is really a result of layering of one kind of federalism on top of another. And we still see, just like when you see a sedimentary rock and you see the different layers, you see examples of more than one kind of federalism in action. So for example, dual federalism still really exists. I mean, you know, the states have their own budget process, the federal government has its own budget process. Uh, states are really highly invested in K-12 education, even though the federal government's interested in it. If you look at the amount of money spent, most of it, the lion's share of money spent on K-12 education is at the state level. Defense is just the opposite. Um, states spend virtually zero on national defense. Um, the federal government spends almost all of it, including the money that, that funds nas the National Guard system. Most of that money comes from the federal government. Um, metamorphic m simply means, uh, like a metamorphic rock, it goes through changes over time as a result of pressure. Um, and so the example that Conlon gives is uh, environmental law. It's more from a local and state concern to a national concern over time, over decades. And then finally, he talks about igneous rock. So, you know, an igneous rock usually comes from a volcanic eruption or a seismic event. And so just like that, we've seen seismic events that change the, na the nature of federalism. The Civil War, some of you referred to in the discussion, really once for all um, decided this issue of can a state s secede from the Union? And the answer was no. Um, the New Deal introduced a, uh, a new relationship into federalism with the, the many programs that were instituted during that time. And the Great Society programs of the Johnson era, 
in particular, Medicare and Medicaid introduced a new dynamic into the federalism relationship. And so this is what Conlon's talking about with his reference to geologic formations. So finally, after that brief overview, and again, um, I didn't talk about everything that's in the readings because obviously I want you to do the readings. But um, so there's a couple things this week that are really important. The first is your term project proposal. Um, that is due June 4th. So please see the assignments tab. Um, everything I wrote down there on this slide is in the assignments tab. If you do have a question or you have a concern, please, please, please do email me and we can discuss it. Because um, I, I want everybody to have a, a, a project that they're happy giving and um, that's going to be interesting to research and that's going to be interesting to present to everyone else. And then finally, the discussion this week, uh, you'll see it, but what I want you to talk about is how these models of federalism seem to fit your agency. And that's what the discussion is about this week. So thanks again, everybody, for the really good discussion last week. I'm looking forward to another one this week, and I will talk to you later. Thank you.